Good morning and welcome. My name is Father Matthew Carnes, and I'm an associate professor here at Georgetown University in our Department of Government. I'm delighted to welcome you this morning to this latest installment in our webinar series produced by the Center for Latin American Studies, which I direct, and our Latin American Leadership Program. We've titled this series, The Americas, Building the Future Together. And over recent and coming weeks, we're exploring the economic, political, and social dynamics and implications of the moment in which we find ourselves in our hemisphere. As we know, the COVID-19 crisis is affecting the world in unprecedented ways. It's stretching thin the resources of both the public and private sectors and exposing long-standing tensions and growing edges of political and economic models. In Latin America in particular, it's seen much of its hard-earned recent growth and democratization called into question, and the countries in the region have responded with widely different policy measures and social responses. This webinar series seeks to uncover trends and divergences inside the region, aiming to uncover opportunities and best practices that can foster inclusion, growth, and opportunity. Today's installment focuses on the social and cultural impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And our panel brings together leaders in the fields of society, culture, literature, and political representation in order to examine the social fractures that the pandemic has caused, as well as the concurrent crises in areas of racial justice and gender and sexual equality and democracy. It emphasizes the challenges that social movements and indigenous groups have faced in terms of health and economic stability, of social inclusion, as well as the creative ways that groups have responded and organized themselves for democratic participation, popular mobilization, and artistic expression. So without further ado, let me turn our attention to our uh, panelists, each of whom deserves a much longer biography than I can present here today. Let me refer you to our website for their full biographies. So first with us today, Ana Dini Morales is a dramatist, translator of poetry, a literary critic, and adjunct professor here at Georgetown University in our Center for Latin American Studies. Her recent works include an opera in Zavala Zavala, an opera in Five Cuts, commissioned by the University of North Carolina um, in 2020, and La Paloma at the Wall, commissioned in the In series. She's also a National Endowment of the Arts Fellow for her translation of Tala by, um, by Nobel laureate Gabriela Mistral, and she's translated works by Alejandra Pizarnik, Nicanor Parra, Mercedes Rofe, and Raul Zurita, and she's a final, who was a finalist for the 2020 Nobel Prize in Literature. Her monograph, Other Solitudes, Essays on Consciousness and Poetry, is forthcoming in 2022. And she received a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Anna, welcome. Thank you. Next, uh, Paula Narvaez is a Chilean psychologist and politician from Universidad Andres Bello. Um, more than 20 years of experience as a public, in public management, public policies, and gender and women's participation. She holds a master's degree in economics and regional management from the Universidad Austral in Chile, and a master's degree in Latin American studies from our very own Georgetown University. She's worked in regional programming offices and as a presidential delegate and chief of staff and advisor to former president Michel Bachelet. Subsequently, she served as Minister General Secretary of the Government of Chile in the second term of the former President Bachelet. And currently, she's a regional advisor in governance and women's political participation at UN Women for Latin America and the Caribbean. Welcome, Paula. Next, Jimena Sanchez Garzoli is the director of the Andes and a leading, and a leading Columbia human rights advocate in the Washington Office on Latin America, WOLA. She's an expert on peace and illegal armed groups, internally displaced persons and human rights and ethnic minority rights. Her work has shed light on the situation of Colombia's more than 7 million internally displaced persons, as well as helped expose the links between Colombia's government and drug-funded paramilitaries. Jimena, welcome. And finally, Vivaldo Santos is an associate professor of Portuguese, Brazilian literature and culture in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese here at Georgetown University. He's also the director of the Portuguese program. He teaches Portuguese language, Brazilian literature and culture, including topics as diverse as film, soccer, Brazilian music, and Brazilian Am the Brazilian Amazon. He's done research on representation of the body in the Brazilian avant-garde, on the intersection of literature and economics, especially on topics such as money, greed, debt, wealth, and the stock market. 
He's currently working on the debate about luxury during the Enlightenment and material culture during the 17th and 18th centuries in, Luso, in the Luso-Brazilian context. He himself is also a poet and a writer of children's literature. Vivaldo, welcome. Thank you, Matt. And now let's turn to our panelists. Thank you again for joining us today to cover this very broad set of topics. And first, I'd like to ask each of you to comment on the reality of COVID-19, this pandemic, in the spaces in which you operate, in the places and people with whom you, you um, work. How is it playing out? Um, how has it affected organizing or cultural production? How is it affecting the individuals and actors that you know best? Um, which groups and activities have been most affected? Maybe we'll start with Jimena. Um, you touch on topics, a broad set of topics, human rights, migration, rights of minorities, indigenous peoples. How do you see the COVID-19 pandemic playing out in, in that realm? Great, well, again, thank you so much for inviting me to this important panel. Um, the end of 2019 uh, in Latin America, we had tremendous social mobilization throughout the entire region um, in Brazil, Colombia, Chile, all over. All of that was basically uh, quieted down by the pandemic and the restrictions that were placed on um, peoples in their different countries to contain it. Um, the pandemic though has had its uh, negative sides when it comes to social organizing and especially social leaders and human rights defenders, um, especially in Colombia, whereby we've seen an increase of killings of those social leaders during the pandemic, specifically because illegal armed groups have taken advantage of the fact of the restrictions to be able to um, get to people they weren't to, able to before. And then secondly, um, because the, the government has um, not been able to activate all of the prevention mechanisms that it can. So we've seen uh, basically a restriction uh, in terms of physically uh, for defenders and for protest. This has particularly affected Afro-descendant indigenous people and women in the more rural areas of the country. Um, that are also areas that are dealing with the pandemic asymmetrically, I would say, because of the fact that there are already vulnerable populations um, that have structurally dealt with uh, racism and were vulnerable because they don't have access to medicine and access to services like um, other populations. Governments have also taken advantage of this to pass through labor reforms that are particularly damaging for the informal worker economy, which is precisely uh, the group of folks that are in a situation where they need to work uh, because they are uh, daily survivors. They're not people who are able to work from home um, in their um, computer. So I think that the pandemic has in many ways uh, put the, the kibosh on some of that visual protest um, that we were seeing. And so groups have been creative and have come up with all sorts of virtual ways uh, to express themselves and continue uh, their advocacy. It's also galvanized um, self-help efforts on the part of indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities where they are basically uh, cutting some themselves off and doing their own restrictions, their own monitoring, um, and also marrying uh, some of their traditional healing practices uh, in order to prevent um, uh, the spread of, of COVID. Thank you. Um, you highlight so well there the ways that this has um, both exposed underlying uh, challenges uh, um, spanning uh, ethnic uh, and racial differences, inequality in the region, and particularly the, the plight of informal workers and those that have been left out in so many different ways, and the ways that then they have organized and um, uh, um, undertaken new efforts um, been galvanized maybe to, in ways that, um, that uh, um, forced them to be more creative. Among those groups, you mentioned women as well. So why don't we turn to Paula um, next. Um, you work in UN Women, you have um, a deep experience with these issues inside of Latin America. Could you speak about how this is particularly affecting women um, in the region? Well, thank you so much, Matthew, and also thank you for having me in this important, uh, I'm great to be part of this, of this panel. Uh, in the same line that Jimena uh, has pointed out, I think that we know from major global and regional uh, and political and socioeconomic analysis that the COVID-19 pandemic will have serious consequences on economies, increases levels of unemployment, vulnerability in the poorest sectors, in addition to stagnation of growth that will affect the whole of society worldwide. 
In Latin America, this crisis is uh, having a devastating impact, being the most unequal region in the world. We have to have that in mind. It was also taken last year by a series of social protests of different nature and in different countries, uh, which, uh, however, are the reflection of the social and political discontent that has been settling in the region and it is, is impacting the model of representative democracy. Access to quality health, education, and employment services was already limited for many people. So that is the, is the background. This crisis related to this pandemic could bring 15.9 million more people in the region into a situation of extreme poverty, bringing the poverty level to 34% of its total population. You can uh, observe the figures from ECLAC and from the recent uh, Secretary General of the United uh, Nations report. What we have been seeing in the past month from UN Women, and, uh, UN Women Regional Office for Americas and the Caribbean is that women and girls will be among the most affected population, especially those at risk of belonging to marginalized groups. So not all women are the same. Considering this increase in poverty, ECLAC indicates that we could reach 100 million women in a situation of poverty in the region. The unemployment resulting from this crisis mainly and doubly affects women who are more present in informal jobs, as Jimena said, including domestic workers who lose their livelihood almost immediately with this pandemic without any network or possibility of replacing the daily income in general and a highly feminized sector such as trade or tourism. This is also a care crisis. Women continue to be the most affected by unpaid care work, which is increasing due to the saturation of health systems and the closure of schools. Because of their status as informal workers, most women do not have uh, do not have access to social protection programs and support services for social reproduction tasks also are insufficient. Latin America, before the pandemic, women spent between 22 and 42 hours per week in unpaid uh, care work, 1.7 hours more than men. In addition, restrictive movement measures to contain the, the pandemic increase the risk of violence against women and girls, especially domestic violence due to uh, increased stress at, at home. Survivors of violence may face additional obstacles in fleeing violent situation or in accessing protection orders uh, or essential lab life-saving services due to factors such as movement restrictions or quarantine. Containment efforts uh, often divert resources from regular, regular uh, health, uh, health service and exacerbate the lack of access to services, including pre and post natal health and care and contraceptives. Finally, uh, all of the above can have a major impact on the exercise of women's political rights as both uh, care responsibilities and economic constraints can be a barrier to the participation of many women in their country's uh, electoral processes, either as candidates or uh, voters. The coronavirus has exposed structural cl class, age, racial, and gender inequalities. We are seeing a reformulation of the relationship between the role of the state and the market and uh, a reduced fiscal space. This crisis is placing the sustainability of life and care at the center of the response. But all this situation that concerns and occupies us at the UN Women, as well as many other UN agencies, states, academic, academia, public institutions, civil society organizations, among others, is also an opportunity to rethink uh, our practices and policies so that we can all emerge from this crisis and its recovery, uh, we hope, leaving no one, no one behind. Thank you so much. What a uh, really powerful overview, and especially building on, um, on Jimena's insights about the way this reaches deeply into society. 
um, every aspect of our economic and social lives, in particular the lives of women. Um, thank you for highlighting that so well. Anna, how do you see this penetrating then cultural life, uh, cultural expression, artistic expression? How do you see the, and maybe the artistic community um, uh, reacting to this? Um, so, so I want to begin with a with a very um, detailed example of things we're working on. So, so I'm on the board of the In Series, an organization, a performance organization here in DC that's about 40 years old. And then I also collaborate with the Gala Hispanic Theater, which is an anchor theater here in DC that's about 45 years old. And um, and and. Our, my, I have a family history with that theater because my mom performed with that theater in the 70s when I was when I was a child. So I've watched this group for a long time. So on as a, as on the board of the In Series, I chair a poetry competition called the Gabriela Mistral Youth Poetry Competition that was founded by a Chilean, uh, Carla Hubner, 11 years ago. And so um, unexpectedly, you know, I, this competition always interested me because it was, um, first of all, dedicated to children and the children had the opportunity to present their poetry in any form they wanted to in any language, um, but particularly of the Hispanic world. So Spanish, Portuguese, and any indigenous language of the Americas. Um, our big challenge this year is connecting with them. So once the, you know, once schools shut down and schools um, across the U.S., uh, particularly serving these vulnerable communities that Jimena, Paula, and you have already pointed out, so vulnerable populations that are already exposed to, you know, uh, particular challenges of unemployment, malnutrition, hunger, um, just getting to school. So, so these kids, their first challenge is um, how are they going to be fed each day, given that they're not going to school if public schools are, are, are giving them the opportunity to eat each day. And then in the meantime, how are we going to get the poetry competition to them so that they can talk about what's going on. Um, whereas in the past, we've had hundreds of, of entries this year, we had a, a very few entries relative to the past. Um, we did extend the competition to Baltimore um, because we wanted to bring those children into the fold of, of this po possibility. It's, it's actually the only competition of its kind that permits children to express themselves in so many languages. Um, and the poems that have come in give us a barometer of what these children are feeling right now. So what are they feeling? They're scared. They are concerned about parents experiencing unemployment, um, uh, insecurity regarding food, um, issues of uh, their parents not being able to manage the problems that, uh, that they themselves are facing and their communities are facing, um, feeling completely cut off from from their peers and what may be support networks for them. So, um, so that's given us, a, as I said, a barometer of how children in this particular region, you know, of this particular Latinx group are doing um, in, in, in the DC metro area and in Baltimore. Um, Thank you. Okay. So could you, do you want me, I can give, go ahead, go ahead, yes. then, you know, so that's just outreach work we do as an organization, like just particular outreach work that helps us, um, you know, develop younger audiences, but the, 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 and develop the voices of youth, of, of Latinx youth across this region. The challenges that theater organizations are facing, and this is across the US. So let me give you a, an example of Gala. Um, and I was just speaking to Abel Lopez, who's, who's an important, he's, he's one of the producers in Gala for many, many years. Um, so basically, Gala is a 45-year-old organization. Um, their operating budget is about $2 million versus their, um, uh, their counterparts whose operating budgets are about $35 million. Mm -hmm. So the challenges of these or of these cultural performance organizations in particular is surviving. And the importance of that survival is that they represent and are dedicated to these groups, right? These groups that um, are, are actually not, continue to not be considered as, as basic to a US fabric. Mm 
right? They continue, even though Latino populations have been here for several centuries, they continue to be uh, marginalized and, and not considered part of the U.S. fabric. So, so the importance of the survival of these organizations is tied to the importance of the ability of these groups to represent themselves into the future, to see possibilities of representation, a recognition of their stories and their hopes and their dreams. Um, so that is, that is what it is at risk. Um, across the US. So again, organizations that were already vulnerable um, are, are experiencing even more pressure. What I'm, um, um, what is striking for me is how organizations, and this is the case for even theaters in Latin America, what is striking for me is that despite the financial challenges these individuals are still dedicated to continuing a connection with their publics as best they can through, um, through the internet. And what's tough is that if you don't have the internet, that's not possible. So that's you know, falling through the cracks. So the question in the future will be, is how to re-suture these relationships, how to bring these, these people back into the fold who had, who had fallen out uh, during this period. Thank you so much. And, and you highlight there both the, the very basic level of survival. You know, how do we make sure that people have enough to eat? And for children, that may be an issue of if you don't have your school provided lunch, then you're hungry. But then there's this other aspect too of expression and so, so powerful, the things they're writing about and the ways we see uh, artistic organizations grappling with those very same issues. How do we survive? And how do we get this important expression out there for people to hear um, uh, voices that might not otherwise be heard? Uh, Vivaldo, you work on representation. Um, and I know you have, among uh, your many, many interests, um, a big Instagram account, too, where you follow a lot of expressions, you know, um, contemporary expressions. I wonder how your work, either in, in representation or in you know, some of these things you've seen recently, um, uh, might help us better understand the, the pandemic at this particular moment. Uh, thank you, Matt. I hope I can address that particular question at the end because I think I I focus a little bit on Brazil in general. I could I think to some extent I probably would echo some of the talks already, but I think you give a general view what's going on in Brazil with the government, but also uh, particularly with the culture. So you all know that about two million people in Brazil have been infected by the COVID-19. Seventy thousand people have died and business are start open without really going through a lockdown. So that's some of the challenge for the Brazilian uh, people. Um, some issues that are very important to, um, you know, Brazil is very similar to certain extent to the US in terms of disinformation, the denial of the existence of the virus, mostly by the current president, Bolsonaro, and the members of his government. And um, recently he has been diagnosed with the virus, but we all believe that he has been already <laughs> diagnosed like two months ago, but he's pushing for the chloroquine, chloroquine use as a medicine. So it's just these issues. And as you know, um, I think um, there are many issues, especially in the big cities and the urban centers like Sao Paulo, for example, uh, Rio, we have like, uh, like more than 100,000 cases, more than 10,000 deaths in Rio. In Sao Paulo, in Manaus, for example, is like a, a big issue. In Manaus, particularly because of Manaus being the north region of Brazil in the Amazon forest, we have um, the indigenous population that it's a very vulnerable group of people. They are have been exposed and they have five times more, you know, uh, vulnerability in terms of uh, being infected by a disease. This is how we can go back to 500 years of colonization and the contact between Europeans and the natives with European disease. So this is an issue that has been brought by the Pan American Health Organization. That's very, uh, it's very delicate and the Brazilian government, they're trying to deny it, but there is a lot of focus on that too. Um, also, there is a, another thing for uh, in the region is because Manaus, for example, Manaus, Rondona, because of the rivers, there is a lot of um, tourists and a lot of, I mean, the distance are very different because there is communications by river, transportation by river. So if you think about, about the problem in the cities, 
if you go back, if you go to the Amazon region, like the distance are much longer. It's much harder to have a hospital or a health center for the indigenous population and other people in the region. In terms of the economy, and I think it's very similar to other countries, it's 12.3% of unemployment so far. And there is a lot of uh, hiring, new hiring policy, change in the labor legislation, especially yesterday, I think there is a push for rehiring with a lower mi minimum wage or pushing for hourly wage instead of monthly wage. So there is a lot of economic issues um, behind these policies that to somehow it, it's a reflect of the neoliberal policy implemented or that they want to be implemented by the Brazilian government these days. Uh, when you think about uh, problems also, I mentioned Amazon, but if you think about the favelas or the slums in Rio and Sao Paulo, those are populations that are really at risk in terms of density of population. And there is a lot of misinformation also because we don't know exactly the numbers. People say that it's more than like uh, 30 times higher than the official numbers. So we won't know until I don't know when. Um, in terms of culture, there are many challenges, I think. Um, Culture in Brazil has been always been, especially in the last for the last ten years, or during the government of the Workers' Party, uh, culture has been always blamed or served as a scapegoat lately um, by the the right wing of the government in terms of that is in Brazil as you know uh, Brazilian culture depend on the state. We have the Juan law in Brazil that gives uh, companies and business tax breaks so they can promote the culture. But since um, for the last 10 years, for the last, you know, since the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff or before that, people have been criticizing the, you know, the state for helping or investing in culture. They think this is a waste of money, that culture should be um, taken care of by the, the private sector um, with the tax incentive that exists, but there is a lot of misuse of the money. But also, you know, we think about culture in Brazil, we know that in terms of economics, very important, like uh, culture is like two to point two percent of the economy in terms of the GDP. It employs like five million people. And we are thinking about uh, employers, not just in the formal, but also in the informal sector. We think we know a lot of um, people that work in the music, uh, in the culture industry. Many people, they have part-time jobs or they're informal. So all these people have been affected by the, the current pandemic. So um, just recently, there is a, a push that's a positive thing. It was pushed by the, the Workers' Party and the PCDB, the Communist, Brazilian Communist Party. And they pushed for uh, um, uh, like an incentive by the government. So the government has given the cultural uh, sector about uh, 30 billions reais that's you know to to help the the art sector in terms of providing them with a minimum of i think 600 reais per month for a period of three months so that's a good thing but it, it caught i mean there was a it's, it's not just the government just approved it but i think there was a lot of fight like just here like the democrats fought to give to the state the government to force the government to provide with um, economic support to the communities. So um, that being said, there are like different uh, initiatives. As Anna also mentioned, there is a lot of online museums being, you know, they already existed, but these days they be more creative, and I think somehow they are getting some incentive, financial incentive to promote or to to, to the public. Um, like thank you. Are you welcome. Yeah, that might be a nice place to sort of transition a little bit. I'm, I'm very struck by um, uh, both the, the grounding you gave us in the Brazilian experience. And Brazil sometimes can seem to be a microcosm for the rest of the region. I mean, it's just so massive with so many different um, currents. Um, and I, I especially appreciated that you highlighted at the end the way that culture and uh, social movements can be engines of change and engines of growth and some, sometimes seen as a bit subversive in that, right? Because they're doing it 
um, sometimes with government support, but sometimes over against the government. Um, and it makes me think a little bit too, when we had our economic um, uh, um, webinar a few weeks ago, the public-private tension sometimes about how do different actors contribute to this overall social good. And so for today, I'd love if in our next round, we thought a little bit about how social and cultural movements and especially cultural expression are engines for change, engines for um, sometimes a bit of subversive change or, or challenging long-term, long-standing um, inequalities. Um, and maybe the ways they're starting to push us in new, hopefully positive directions. You know, is there a way that we might actually come out of the pandemic socially stronger than we went in or socially more aware at least and able to um, see social change. Um, uh, and why don't we begin uh, with Jimena again, if, you, if you'd like to maybe start there with, where do you see um, creative change happening? What are your signs of hope in this maybe um, as you look at the region? Sure. Um, so another thing that happened during this pandemic was the assassination on TV of <laughs> George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And that's also um, been an influence influencing factor in the region, especially in Colombia and in um, Brazil. Um, you know, Latin America has always had a very um, strange idea of racism and, you know, it depends which country you, you are talking about specifically. Some countries, you know, basically it's been an all out denial and other has been sort of this idea of accepting um, all the different cultures as basically being one and in a sense negating those cultural identities. Um, and so this is not a new problem. This is a long-standing problem, but one thing that I've seen amongst the Afro-Colombian um, and indigenous groups and also some of the Afro-Brazilian um, groups is taking advantage of that conversation that was started with all the media interest in what was happening in the U.S. to bring up those long-standing issues. Um, and they've been very creative about it. So uh, for example, uh, there, despite the fact that people are under quarantine, there has been a um, protest of indigenous and Afro-Colombian peoples from the Pacific all the way up to Bogota. And the way that they've done it creatively is by including people in their protests virtually. So they're virtually like walking in the streets with you know the camera and talking to people that way. Uh, there have been several virtual protests. There have also been, you know, the traditional banging of pots, uh, especially against Bolsonaro for his lack of effective response on COVID, but also um, in other countries. And so um, I think one interesting thing that we hope will come out of this pandemic is that um, the fact that everybody's at home and everybody's been seeing what's been going on, that is going to lead to more debates about these issues, more open conversations about you know what has been the structural and historical racism and discrimination in these countries why are afro and indigenous peoples and in the rural areas in the situation they're in that they're so um, vulnerable uh, to a crisis like the one um, that we're facing today so it's important also to mention that for afro descent indigenous communities that we work with culture is interspersed with a protest um, it's negative in the sense that, you know, the collective gathering in music, dance, and other forms of expressions are really sort of psychosocial support for everyone there and a way for people communicating. So the, the being closed in has been very uh, difficult in terms of um, psychological impacts um, and very isolating, but also that um, we're seeing that within that protest and expression, it includes the arts, it includes um, music and includes dance. And so hopefully um, we will, when things open up more, we will see a different way of relating amongst those populations um, and also a bigger, more open debate about the structural uh, racism in the region. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate the way you pivoted us to race, which is such a fundamental issue. One that, um, uh, as you mentioned, is long standing in the region but that has been galvanized in a particular way now um, uh, um, during the pandemic, um, almost surprisingly, you know, so you had broad social movements in the streets um, uh, prior to the pandemic around general uh, economic issues. And then this really highlighted, or we gave it a focus on race in a particular way. And that's um, something that uh, is generating lots of new um, expression. Um, and really, I think, forcing us um, throughout the region to confront issues of race that had, as you say, too long been denied or or papered over, um, uh, hugely important. 
Paula, how are you seeing this play out both for women, and I know you're also a Chilean, um, and uh, Chile, of course, being one of the uh, um, places of, of greatest social protest immediately prior to the pandemic and then continuing protest going onward. Um, yeah, how are you seeing this play out? Okay, well, um, I think that I can share with you some perspective from public policy point of view. Uh, I think I can share with you four ideas uh, from, from, this, from this perspective. Uh, so I think first, the differentiated impact of the pandemic on women and the situation of vulnerability for different sectors of the population have been brought into focus and thus also into discussion. And I think that is a very important point. Today's uh, public debate makes it possible to revalue and propose the expansion of rights for those who perform care work, pointing out how they impact on the different areas of labor and on women's public and, poli and political life. There is a debate uh, about unpaid care work and the need to create public systems to protect it. In addition, there is a need to professionalize paid care work, guarantee better conditions for workers and integrate them into the discussion table while strengthening public health systems. In this context, the identification in different countries that these essential tasks are and have been carried out by, for example, migrant women also points out the urgency of the recognition of rights. Secondly, the accelerated virtualization of different aspects uh, and uh, uh, of life, uh, family and social interaction, work, education, and instances of public and political participation implies the possibility for broader, plural, and democratic participation and exchange among network of women and activists in different areas and from different countries. That's a very important uh, issue, no? The challenge is to address the region's digital gap, which especially affects women, and to generate tools for the eradication of violence uh, against women, and specifically cyber violence. The potential of these tools, which we have all learned very, very quickly in the face of the pandemic, can be increased by democratizing access for rural and indigenous women, persons with disabilities, communities without connectivity, and sectors that are not yet educationally or digitally literate. Thirdly, the COVID-19 also highlighted the management of women in the executive branches of different countries and cities, as well as the value of the community leadership of women who across the region attend the needs of food, care, violence, among other issues. Women are in the front line of response to the crisis. And even though they are aren't represented at the decision-making tables, they have shown that, they, that uh, where they are, incorporate and do so with a management approach based on human rights, gender, and intersectionality. Uh, they can provide responses that better contain the pandemic situation, crisis, and recovery. Even though it should not be in the news, the fact that it is implies that the, the belief that assumed that women could not take charge of public service has been broken down entirely. So that's very good news. This must invite us to redouble our efforts to build not only a mechanism for parity democracies, but also generate tools that truly make substantive equality possible based on intersectionality. Finally, this crisis has called into question the role of the state, not only in terms of its public health system, but also in terms of the possibilities of responding with social, economic, and political policies in, the, in their entirety and from citizenship that demands listening, dialogue, participation, and effective, rapid, and comprehensive policies. In this scenario, uh, debates such as universal income, 
debt, uh, debt restructuring in Latin American countries, among other measures promoted by example for, uh, by uh, ECLAC and other organizations, call into question the sustainability of lives and the responsibility of the state in this regard. This new role of public leadership also presents challenges that must be addressed to ensure that the response is inclusive and strengthens democratic systems. Once again, the need to incorporate women into decision-making spaces is, uh, go with the need to generate participative practices that include civil society organizations, experts, academics, and scientists, among others, to design inclusive policies. The strengthening of institution and citizen oversight is a priority in the face of the responsibility to eradicate corruption and strengthen transparency. Here again, especially in Latin America and the Caribbean, these responses must consider the differentiated impact on women and address human trafficking, sex torsion practices, and anti-corruption policies that enable the proper and the responsible use of public resources. Undoubtedly, this can contribute to the strengthening of democracy, which is an urgent need in the region as another part of the world as well. And another side, the growing of, of the use of ICTs in public administration has been accelerated by the pandemic, which constitute the transformation opportunity never seen before. This digitalization, however, demands that the state consider the gaps and guarantee responses by digital mechanisms in the opportunity to extend its practices. Finally, the growing conflict caused by the crisis, unemployment, and post-pandemic poverty challenge states to provide democratic responses that respect human rights. Faced with the postponement of uh, elections in six countries in the region, Bolivia, Chile, Mexico, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Dominican Republic, which held its elections a few days ago, uh, the need to take measures that consider the impact on women, such as Thank inclusion you. and conduct of campaigns that do not affect the right of rural indigenous, more remote and or displaced groups. And just a, a, a last, a, a last uh, thing, I think that we, uh, the, the invitation is to dialogue and think about this great opportunity that we can have to do the things differently. Uh, in the end, and the new realities will be those that we can develop together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And especially that last point about connectivity um, is so important and the ways that we build dialogue in new ways. And both the technology uh, facilitates that in some ways and prevents it in others because we know access to technology is not uh, universal. In fact, it's quite um, complicated, especially for a number of marginalized groups, rural groups. Um, uh, so this is one of the great challenges, it's something each of you has already highlighted a bit. Um, but I wonder if, actually, before I forget, uh, to all our uh, observers, we'd be happy to take some questions if you want to use the Q&A function. And we're collecting those questions, so feel free to type them into the Q&A box. And I'm being fed those and can then um, give them to our uh, participants in just a few moments. But I want to turn next to Anna um, Dini. And say, Anna, how are you seeing creative responses? And maybe some of that is about building dialogue or building this kind of connection among peoples, getting voices out there that maybe haven't been heard or new ideas. Um, where are you seeing signs of hope or opportunity? I mean, to get back to some of the topics Jimena and Paula and, and Vivaldo were pointing out before, um, just for example, Black Lives Matter in the Latinx uh, performance. Uh, infrastructures, you know, like theaters, performance spaces, publishing houses, boards, the, the, the deep difference that we see now is that there's a, there's a distinction between saying, I am an ally and I'm doing something about this at a structural level. So, um, so Black Lives Matter has, has incited um, a sense of reckoning that is long overdue. 
and, and the sense that um, organizations are going to be held publicly responsible for this reckoning. And internet actually allows that, right? As, 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 as much as sometimes we're concerned about the proliferation of voices, it also um, has this capacity to hold people responsible. So, you know, back to one of the points Vivaldo was bringing up in Brazil, where are we allocating funds? Where are, um, the US has a pretty robust sense of allocating you know, private and public funds um, to the arts, but historically Latinx and Black organizations are historically underfunded, um, you know, vis-a-vis um, -vis their, their counterparts. So I think that that is a very um, important opportunity um, that's coming up um, as far as this crisis is concerned. Shifting to, to the Southern Cone, um, Chile right now has their um, has their national prize uh, in literature, which is pending. So the list of finalists have come out. And um, recently, one of the universities there held a, a Zoom event in which about 25 of the women uh, finalists were asked to read some of the poetry they were working on. So that was a First of all, I got to watch that from here. People were on the call from all over Europe, all over Latin America and, and the United States. It permitted um, different, it, it permitted us again to have a sense of a barometer of what people are experiencing. So some of the issues that these women brought up were, for example, Veronica Zondek, who's a writer who's um, in her 70s. So she experienced the Chilean dictatorship. And this is a concern I've seen not only in Zondek's work, but in other writers. Um, and it's that the, um, the strategies of governmental restriction are similar to the so so in other words how the way you limit the spread of the virus is the same way you limit the spread of ideas <laughs> the same way you limit you know the proliferation of of um of concepts that um have the ability to to go against the government right so so what was interesting and painful to hear there is first of all um um a remembrance of the trauma. So, uh, uh, you know, the, it, it, this was triggering a traumatic, it's triggering a traumatic reaction um, from people who have that memory, that historical memory. Second of all, it reflects individuals who, who still do not completely trust their government and, and, and its purpose in these restrictions. And third, it reflects individuals who don't trust the government into the future in the sense that if the government has this ability to now to restrict movement and the spread of a virus in the future, there's, there also still exists this, abil this, you know, this ability to restrict the development of cultural ideas. Um, do you know, you asked this question of what is the importance of culture and, and the importance is that when you want to control a population, the first thing you do is you control their ability to tell a story. Mm -hmm. The first thing you do is control their ability to tell a joke because there are always those on the inside and the outside of a joke. So cultural forms and that connection, stories, poetry, jokes, um, having a glass of wine together or coffee or whatever it is, a cafecito, that is the ground zero of, of a fabric of connections in a, in a society. And, and so you will always see across societies that the, the you know for example in enslaved populations what's the number one thing you want to do don't allow them to bond with one another either through familial stories stories passed on uh, jokes in a community community stories um, uh, forms of, 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 of cultural forms of, of dance, of, of theater, whatever it is. So that is the importance of culture in a community. And when you take that away, um, what, what you have is, is a deep sense of solitude, which is actually dangerous because that takes away people's sense of hope and their attachment to the past and their movement into the future. So I think the most, what's, what's striking is that 
what across, uh, let, me, let me give you an example of El Teatro Colón, it, which is an important theater in, in Buenos Aires in Argentina. Despite the fact that they had been shut down, they basically asked their patrons to, if they could hold the, um, do you know, the subscription funds. So even though the patrons would no longer be able to go to the theater for that season because they're closed, they asked for the patrons to, if they could hold those funds. So instead of just holding those funds, what the theater did was they decided to provide free lessons online for people between the ages of 14 and 24. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's where I have found like the innovation and the hope in the sense that the number one goal is to maintain the lines of communication open, to not allow people to feel alone, because that's, that's, that's the true tragedy, mm -hmm. right? To, yeah, feel, yeah. to feel that you're alone, to feel that there's no hope, to feel that your voice isn't heard, that your community is broken, and that's what we, at, in the cultural field, have to guard against. It's, it's, it's salvaging the human spirit in, in what is truly um, a catastrophe. Yeah, no, and one of the cruelest and most challenging aspects of the pandemic is the, the need to, to sometimes isolate, right? And so the ways you can build these creative river, uh, bridges, and you know, the example of the Teatro Colón is wonderful in that regard, right? So well, we can't congregate, but we can connect, and we can do lessons, and we can actually learn this this idiom, if you will, this language, this way of expression, um, and still stay connected. That's a marvelous And, and many, many organizations, I mean, I gave you a theater example. Sure. The example also exists in, um, in publishing houses who are providing free works online, something they had never done before, because anyway. Yes, I want to make sure we also get a chance for Vivaldo to chime in. Uh, it's, it's been, it, we're having such a robust conversation. I want to make sure we have a chance for Vivaldo to also jump in and weigh in a little bit on this in terms of signs of hope that you're seeing and ways that you're seeing expression um, uh, play out, whether in Brazil or in your uh, um, uh, broader explorations of the region. Thank you, Matt. Um, I've tried to make it short so people have time for question. Just two things. Uh, one is uh, related to the uh, DC, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's interesting, I follow uh, street art and it's amazing to see how after, um, after the, you know, when they start the demonstration, the looting, all the stores, the men of the buildings in the city, they boarded the store. And so what happened in the city, a lot of artists, they started painting on those boards. It's amazing. There is a whole narrative about the Black Lives uh, Movement, uh, Matter movement in DC, for example. Also in terms of the own DC city, also with the DC 51, there was a movement to make DC the 51st state. So there is a lot of commission art and murals going, going on here in the Washington DC area. It's fascinating, not just uh, Black Lives Matter, but the Black Women's Lives Matter. There's a lot of going on in, there in terms of that. In terms of going back to Brazil, I think echoing a little bit of, I think it's um, uh, what has been said already uh, in here. Going back to the three, mid, three billion um, incentive by the Brazilian government, I think one issue, one um, not issue, but I think one policy that's gonna that has become and will become very important for Latin America and Brazil, for example, we have already Bolsa Familia, but there is a push for the minimal um, universal um, the need and urgency of the creation of a program minimal income to everyone because it, given the situation like now, so this is gonna be a challenge and also it's gonna be very important for all the government, including the US as we've seen. So, you know, going back to technology and education inequality, that's another issue that we hope and you know, the issue is gonna come up with the inequality between public schools and private school. So I'll stop here because I think I'm gonna echo with some of what my colleagues have said, but I'm open for questions. After. Wonderful, thank you. Now we, we've had some questions come in, but I actually feel like our time is limited enough that I think we're going to just proceed to our final round here, if you will. Um, and it's mainly to ask you, you know, Georgetown is a university. We have undergraduate and graduate programs. Thank goodness, um, we, uh, international students make up a significant portion of our student community and uh, they will be very pre prominently represented on our campus this year in spite of uh, the government ruling and now rescinded, thank goodness. Um, 
But I wonder if you were speaking to one of our students and were saying to them, you know, in light of the pandemic, here's the one thing I'd encourage you to study or the one thing I'd encourage you to think about. What would you say to, you know, to students today at a place like Georgetown that might be thinking about serving in the region um, in the future? So I'll just turn it to each of you, you know, for just one brief comment, if I could. Maybe I'll start again with Jimena. Sorry, I, think I can find the button. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I'm very glad that they rescinded that. That was horrible. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think, um, you know, an example of what was done today is a good example. Breaking outside of your, you know, narrow paradigm or is it anthropology? Is it human rights? Is it culture? You know, um, because we all need to think creatively and we really need to think outside of the box. But in general, on Latin America, I would say this is the time to really start looking at those deep roots of racism and history and you know what people have been taught what people haven't been taught and you know what needs to really become um, a debate in in all of these societies what a wonderful answer and one that i can i will use often with our students i always remind them of the importance of the program we offer is that it's interdisciplinary so it really gets them to break out of silos and i always remind them too the importance of understanding the historical deep roots, because often there's a temptation to run with whatever the latest thing is. And the, the privilege of being a student for a couple of years is to really ground yourself in those, you know, those deeper traditions, whether they're literary traditions, whether they're historical narratives, uncovering narratives that haven't been read before. Is so crucial to that. Thank you. What a wonderful uh, way of framing that. Uh, Paula, what would you say to a student? Well, it's a, it's a very challenging question, I think, because um, all of us have a you know personal and subjective ex experience but i think that we have to be sure that we can do the difference mm -hmm. and we have to assume that in a very deep way how can i do the things differently to change the world because you have a lot of resources around you you have this a great opportunity to be in this great university with these great teachers and think the world and also go out to that world and make that things happen differently. Because now, more than ever, we have to use that, you know, well-known uh, idea of the crisis is an opportunity. All of us listen that, you know, that idea <laughs> very often. So we need to know how we, we have to do now that different. It's absolutely essential, fundamental, critical. We can't you know, continue doing the same things. And we have for that to be absolutely, I think, humble. At the same time, we, we have to identify with others. We have to feel that the suffering of others is also impacting my own life so uh, and for that i think that a university as georgetown with the principles and value that you are sharing uh, in, in in your classes we have to uh, spread that spirit also outside the university and also at the, at the last sentence is use the history to understand also the present and the future yes. No, marvelously very, said. Very critical uh, uh, thing, and the university gives that you can learn from the history to to face the future as well. Yes, no, that's so important, and I especially appreciate the way you you name the ability to change the world. The world that we receive is not the world that we have to forever live in. That we can actually be agents of change in that, and in a world that can often be quite cynical or skeptical. Those are important words. Thank you so much. Anna, what would you say to a student? So these days? I completely agree with what Jimena and Paula are saying. A deep sense of hope. We have to have hope. You have to say we're going to solve these problems because there's no choice not to. Um, a deep sense of humility, and I would add tenderness to that in the sense that we need to listen to those who are least listened to and least represented. And that's very hard because it means we have to be quiet for some time and, and, and think about how other models, and there's so many models, economic models, cultural models, um, familial models in Latin America, and we need to allow them to inform us and, and learn how to dialogue with them. Um, yeah, and, and look at structural roots and, and have a lot of empathy, as, as Paula said, a lot of empathy. The, the, 
the least is as important to us as as ourselves so yeah. so we really need to to look at that yeah thank you and i love those especially those words tenderness listening empathy such important core core values and, and ways of approaching things Ivaldo, what would you say to a student well um just echoing everybody i think despite the crisis and its effect on the world i truly believe that there are many opportunities uh, arising to transform it and to make it a better place and uh, georgetown has the georgetown social justice principle can serve as we as well faculty and students to transform the society and many inequalities issues that have been talking about history have been exposed and shook we all know about it but i think the pandemic is teaching us a lot it's still not resolved and we need to address those issues to make a better world just the final thoughts i think and just a final mention of brazil i think one figure that's going to be very important not just for the student but i think is going back to paulo freire's uh, pedagogy of the press as a fundamental to help teachers and professors to look at education in a more humanistic way in which students uh, are seen as diverse but also as a subject with an own way of learning and with a particular background i think the challenge is going to be not just for the student but also for faculty and teachers how to look at a student as a diversity subject and considering their backgrounds and how to make that uh, different from the way we we all have been teaching and learning and uh, traditionally i love that actually it's a great place to close and then you know, many of us as professors are thinking about how do we adopt new technologies, but what we need to think about behind the technologies are the students and you're reminding us of how diverse students are really crucial to who will be engaging, how we can hear them, and especially that, how we can listen to them, as Anna said, you know, and, and really learn from them, um, become active co-creators with them, um, rather than merely dispensers of knowledge. Um, that's certainly what we aim to do. I think it's part of what this conversation has contributed to um, today. So Ana, Jimena, Ivaldo, Paula, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for this really robust conversation. Uh, thank you everyone online who's been joining us for the last little while. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. Keep your eyes out. There are plenty more things coming from Georgetown in the coming months. We look forward to engaging with you often. So thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you all.